Cross Community Church. There we are. Welcome once again, Cross Community Church. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, y'all, the second service is getting full. Uh, y'all are late, folks. It's never full when we start, but it's full now. So thanks for being here today. We're continuing our series through Advent. And if you weren't here last week, Advent, it just means coming or arrival. And so in this season, as we walk through Advent, we're celebrating the coming or arrival of Jesus. And so we look back to his first coming And we celebrate all that that means for us as the people of God. And then we look ahead to the second coming of Jesus. Now last week, um, kind of the theme of the week is hope. And we look back and we shared communion together, remembering the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. His body that was offered up and his blood was shed is the source uh, of our hope as believers. Now this week, the theme of Advent is peace. Now, Peace is it's a really important theme of the Bible, but it's one that we don't often talk about. It's mentioned 367 times, depending upon what translation uh, you're using. Uh, but I want you to know that the, the Hebrew word for peace, it's shalom. It is a beautiful word that is rich in meaning. So if you would, just sit back for a minute. I want to read you the various ways that this word shalom is translated uh, in the Old Testament. It's translated as peace, quiet, tranquility, contentment, as harmony, as safety, security, completeness, soundness, and as welfare. And I don't know about you, but just hearing those definitions, hearing those words, it makes me want to close my eyes and exhale and breathe out all of the stress and the pressure and the fear and anxiety that I often feel in my life. Like if I'm just being honest, I want if if that's what peace is, I want it. But many of us think about peace a lot like we do the fountain of youth. We'd love to find it and certainly would enjoy its benefits, but we're not sure that it really exists. Here's what I want you to know. Peace is possible. Peace is possible. Now, here around the holidays, it may not feel like it. Here around the holidays where it seems like all the stress and pressure and fear, anxiety is kind of amped up, it's multiplied in our lives. Maybe you're you're here today and rather than feeling peace, what you feel is chaos. And where everyone else seems to have this season of joy and excitement, um, it really, it's just wearing you down. It feels like weight. Maybe it's the weight of planning or preparation or shopping or wrapping or just trying to get to all of the parties and the events that you're going to have. And rather than feeling like peace, you're, you're feeling chaos in your life. Maybe for you it's a season of stress. Maybe that's relational stress. While everyone else loves to get together with family and friends and they celebrate when you think about getting together with your family, that's just a source of stress. Maybe you're afraid it's going to be another year of fighting or another year of pain or another year where someone seems to have forgotten you. Maybe for you it's financial stress. And you you want to love people well, you want to give them great gifts, but you're not sure how you're going to make ends meet. You're concerned, like, what am I going to do? And maybe for you, it's a season of emotional pain. This is the first season that you'll be walking through this holiday season without a loved one, someone who is precious to you. Maybe it's a time of hurt. Once again, I want to remind you that peace is possible. I believe that Jesus wants you to have peace. He wants us to walk in in that sort of peaceful, quiet, tranquil, tranquil, contented sort of life. Here's the thing. Peace is not found in the absence of conflict or of stress or of trials. But rather, peace is found in a person, and his name is Jesus. Now, our Advent reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 9. And I love this passage. Obviously, you've heard it probably read around the Christmas season many times, but this is God speaking to his people 
through the prophet Isaiah. And he's delivering this message to his people. And it must have been one of great hope. I want to read it to you in in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, for to us. Now, um, if you were a member of the nation of Israel, you were a part of the us. Now, today, we are the people of God. And so if you want to just read this us as us, as we, then, then you're entitled to do so, right? Here's what God was promising. Now, here, the difference between us and Israel was they were looking ahead to when this was ultimately going to happen, and we get to look back to when this has already happened, okay? So here, here's what the prophet says again. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. One child with four different names and a whole lot of responsibility, right? No pressure for all that this child was going to to do and all that this child was going to bring. Now, if you were a part of the nation of Israel... And you were even decent, you know, kind of caught up following uh, what was happening in the life of Israel. You would have already known that God is a source of peace. Like you would have understood this intuitively uh, of being a part of the nation of Israel. Here, here's what had happened. God had made a covenant with Israel. He chose a people for himself. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 3 through 6, he kind of lays out functionally what it's going to look like for his people to enjoy peace. Here's what he says. He says, if, again, to the nation of Israel, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you rains in season. The land shall yield its increase. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest. And the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing. And you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. I will give you peace in the land. And you shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. I will remove harmful beasts from the land and the sword shall not go through your land. God had given his people as a part of the old covenant. He'd given them his law, and he'd promised them his peace. If you walk according to my statutes, if you obey my commands, you will experience my peace. Now, this is pretty simple, right? Not a lot of legal jargon in here. It's not, you know, pages long where God lists. It's pretty simple. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. If you obey my commandments and walk in them, I'm going to give you peace. But it's also beautiful, isn't it? I can think about this. This was a way that God would, would reveal more of himself to his people and they could know him and experience his goodness. And so what would happen was God would bless the people. The rains came, the harvest was produced, the trees produced their fruit. They were allowed to dwell in safety and security. Their enemies weren't given victory over them. And, and as God did that, the people of God would see his goodness all the more and they would love him more and they would serve him more and they would want to obey him more. It's this beautiful relationship where God cares for his people and they recognize his power in their lives and they worship him all the more. It's a simple and beautiful arrangement. But there was just one problem with this arrangement. The people of God could never uphold their end of the bargain. They never were able to keep the law of God. Every time God would bless them, they would forget him. They would fail to acknowledge him. They would fail to love him. They would begin to rebel against God. Rather than keeping his commands, they would break them. And not only that, their hearts would grow so cold that they would begin to worship the, the false gods of the nations around them. And and before long, they would be offering sacrifices to these false gods, thanking them for the things that God had provided. They broke the law of God over and over and over. And what God would do, because he loved them, and he wanted to draw his people back to him, was he would remove his peace. The rains may not fall. The harvest may not have been produced. Their safety and security would be threatened by one of the surrounding nations. 
And just like you and I might do, when things got difficult, boy, they began to cry out to God. They began to turn back to God. God, rescue us. Save us. God, would you provide for us? God, would you bless us once again? And God, in his extraordinary patience and compassion, he would restore his people. He would forgive their sin. He would draw them back to himself only to have them, as soon as things got better, begin to forget and rebel against him again. And this cycle happens over and over and over. If you've read the Old Testament, the story of the nation of Israel, it was like rejection, rebellion, followed by repentance when things got difficult. And God was gracious and brought his people back, only to have, him, have them reject him again. Over and over and over that would happen. And if you read the Old Testament, you might even be tempted to think, what was their problem? Like, it was pretty clear, right? Like, just obey God and he's going to bless you. But before we look down on the people of Israel, we might need to remember that we're a lot like them, aren't we? We tend to turn to God when things get difficult. We cry out to him, God, would you help me? Would you provide for me? Would you save me? I've done this dumb thing. Would you fix it? God, help me. But then when things go smoothly, we tend to forget him. We tend to think that the provision that we experience, well, that's because I work hard. That's because, I, man, I'm talented. I am smart. Look at me. Look what I've done, right? And we take our eyes off of God who's given us all these things, and we place them on ourselves or some other thing. We're just like the nation of Israel. But I have good news for you. The good news is that God had a greater plan for peace for his people. A plan that wouldn't depend upon our goodness or our faithfulness, but upon God's goodness and God's faithfulness. This is the new plan for peace. And so, here's what God did. He sent a child to be born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. God came to secure a better peace and to initiate a greater covenant. Now, government in this, this, this passage, it's a weird word. Like when you're reading it in the Old Testament, you just come across the word government. You're like, what even is this? Well, uh, here's what it means like Hebrew-wise. It just means rule or dominion. So God promised to send a child, a son, and all rule and dominion would rest upon his shoulders. And he gave him four different names, one, one son, but four different names to, to lay out what ultimately he was doing for us. The first name that he gave him was Wonderful Counselor. I don't know about you, uh, but I'm not the most wise person ever. I need help. I need a lot of counsel in my life. I need a lot of advice. I need a lot of wisdom from other people. So maybe you are a counselor, you've been to a counselor, or you've received wise counsel from somebody. Um, if you're very smart, you know that we all need this in our lives. But this isn't any ordinary counselor that God was sending in this child. He's called a wonderful counselor. And in the Hebrew, this gives us the sense. Uh, the word wonderful, it means marvelous or magnificent or transcendent, which means this counselor is beyond human ability. His wisdom has no end. God was sending a wonderful counselor, one who was all wise and all knowing. The, the big nerdy Christian word for this is that he was omniscient. He was all-knowing. God was going to send a child, a son, into the world who knew everything. He understood every detail in the life of every single person who has ever existed or ever will exist. Like he managed every facet of everything going on in the world all at the same time, and it didn't even make him tired. There is a wonderful counselor that God has sent to teach us and to lead us and to guide us in the path of truth. And he did that for us, for his people, that we might know the way that we should go. He's also called a mighty God. This isn't just a son. This is God in the flesh. He's not an ordinary man. He is fully divine. The word mighty 
here gives us a sense of a champion, a rescuer, or a savior. A powerful savior. A powerful champion. A victorious ruler. This God, by virtue of the fact that he's God, by virtue of the fact that he is a mighty God, this is an all-powerful God. Not only is he all-knowing, he is all powerful, which means there is no one greater than him. Like he doesn't lose a battle, right? He's always victorious. He is all powerful, which means all things are under his control. Nothing happens apart from him. He's all powerful. The the 50 cent word for that is omnipotent, by the way, if you want to Write that down and nerd out with your friends this week. Hey, what do you think about the principle of omnipotence, right? That's there. So God sent a child, a son, to be our all-powerful champion, to fight for us. But he continues. He calls him an everlasting father. This wonderful counselor, this mighty God is also described as a father to us. Fathers love And they care for, they protect, they provide, and they comfort their children. He's a good father to us. And God sent him that we might have the wonderful counselor to lead us and guide us, the mighty God to save us, to rescue us, and a father to love us, to care for us, to protect us, And to provide for us. And the beauty of this father is that he is everlasting. He's eternal without beginning or end. Which means he's not a deadbeat or a dropout. Um, He will never leave us, abandon us, or forsake us. He will be with us always. We'll never go anywhere that our father isn't. All-knowing, all-powerful, eternal Father who loves us and cares for us and is for us. God sent the child, the Son, to us. And then the the final descriptor we're given here of this child, of this Son, is that he is the Prince of Peace. In the Hebrew, this phrase is the Shar Shalom. It means the one who secures peace. The one who secures peace. God is sending a child. He sent his son to secure our peace that we might live peaceful, quiet, tranquil, contented, harmonious lives. Not lives of stress and anxiety and fear and all the things that we might feel, but that we might live these lives of shalom. This one who secures peace is like the one who goes into battle to defeat the enemies that he might secure the safety and security of the land. That's what God sent the child, his son, to do for us. So you might ask the question, who is this child? Who is this son, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace? This is Jesus. And if you were a member of the nation of Israel, you would have looked forward to this time. And you would have anticipated the day that God would send this child. For us, we get to look back with gratitude to the day that God sent his son, Jesus. God in the flesh, the all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal son of God who stepped down out of heaven and made his dwelling among us. God came to be with us. And he sent Jesus, his son, into the world to save the world and to establish a better covenant and to secure our peace. The prince of peace came to secure our peace. Now, most of the time, Uh, the Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, the way that he would secure peace is through bloodshed. I mean, you think about this with Israel and Ukraine right now. The way that they're striving to secure their peace in their land is they're going to go fight against the enemy. They're going to shed the blood of the enemy. They're going to drive them out and secure the peace in their land. But Jesus did things differently. He secured peace not by shedding the blood of his enemies, but by shedding his own blood 
for those who were to him at that moment his enemies. Just like the Israelites in the Old Testament, we sin against God. We haven't kept the law. We are prone to wonder. We fall into sin. We go and chase after worthless idols. And because of our sin, we've been separated from God. We don't get to enjoy his peace because instead we're separated from God by our sin. We haven't kept the law. We don't enjoy his peace. But Jesus came to secure our peace. And he did that by keeping the law perfectly for us. Hey, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. If you keep my commands, you walk in my statutes, you will have my peace, right? So Jesus He comes and he secures that peace for us. He kept the law perfectly down to the letter. And then with that sin that separated us from God, Jesus went to the cross to offer an atoning sacrifice for our sin. That that what happened is the great exchange that we talk about all the time, where there on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame, and he bore them on himself. And God poured out his wrath for our sin. On his son Jesus. And God took that perfect, righteous life where he fulfilled the law in every way. And he credited that to us so that we might enjoy this relationship with our Savior once again. And enjoy his peace. By going to the cross, Jesus established this new covenant. A new covenant in his blood where he upheld both sides of the deal. He provides peace, and he was the one who kept the law, and his peace was provided through his blood. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this. He sa- it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how to get true and lasting peace? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by trying harder to keep the law. You already failed at that, right? Deal's done. Like, you didn't keep your end of the bargain. I haven't either. It's not by trying harder. It's not by doing more good things to try to ingratiate yourself to God. Jesus came and upheld both ends of the deal. He fulfilled the law perfectly, and he died on the cross to take your sin so that you might be united with God and enjoy his peace. We enter into this peace through the simple act of faith, trusting in the life and the sacrificial death of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection to save us from sin and to give us peace with God. It's through faith and faith alone, not by our works. Our God loved us that much to send a child, his son, to be our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, and our prince of peace. But here's the thing. Faith is not just something we exercise unto salvation, right? Oh, I've got faith in God. I'm good. God downloads all this power into me and I really don't have need of him or of faith anymore. But rather, faith is something that we have to exercise every single day. Not that if we don't, you know, we fail one day, God doesn't love us anymore. God has got us. He has saved us. It is finished. That work is done. But if we are going to enjoy the peace that he purchased for us, if we're going to enjoy the peace that he has made available to us, we have to walk in it by faith. When I was younger and my kids were really young, I used to love to, I used to make my mom crazy a little bit, okay? So we had a couple of things I would do with my kids, and I thought it was so much fun. The first was I would tell them to stand, like, stiff as a board, you know? So they're like little bitty kids. They can barely walk, and I'm like, stand stiff as a board. And I would put them in my palm, their feet, and I would balance them, you know, like you might do with a bat. And, of course, my mom is freaking out, uh, but she kind of got over that, and that wasn't as fun. So I was like, we got to up, up the ante here a little bit. And so I started tossing my kids up into the air, you know. And, and of course, it delighted the kids, you know. They get to fly in the air. And, and here's the thing. While my mom's freaking out, they, they would, you know, land in my arms. And they'd say, Daddy, do it again. Or even the, the dreaded word my mom might hear, 
higher. Of course, I took that like a personal challenge, like, oh, we can do this, you know, and I would just launch my kids as like as high in the air as I possibly could, and I would catch them, and it was so much fun. And while my mom was, was totally freaking out, which she should have been, by the way, I was putting my, lives, my children's lives in danger. It wasn't the most wise thing to do. While my mom was freaking out, my kids were at perfect peace. Do you know why? Because they knew their father would catch them. And in the same way for us in this life, because we know who God is, because we know that he knows all things, that he is all powerful, that he is an everlasting father who loves us and cares for us, who protects us, provides for us because he is our prince of peace. We can trust him in the ups and the downs of this life, the times that make us afraid or fearful or stressed, we can come back and exercise faith in God and have his peace through that faith. We have to walk in that, trusting not in our ability to navigate the circumstances or difficulties, but in his power to act on our behalf. Here's the thing. Your heavenly Father has got you. Period. End of story. He's got you whether you believe it and trust in it or not. But we need to grow in our exercise of faith. we got to build ourselves up, like working out a little bit, right? We work out our faith a bit. We renew our minds in the Word of God, remembering who God is and ultimately what He's done for us. Here's the deal. For believers, the peace that we experience in this life is directly proportional to the faith that we exercise. I'll say it again. The peace that we experience in this life is directly proportional to the faith that we exercise in any given moment. Our peace is assured, but it's not always realized. We don't always walk in what God has done for us. And so I want to give you just four ways that we can exercise faith and experience God's peace, okay? The first is this. We exercise faith by consulting our counselor. I don't know about you, but I have opinions about how things should go in the world. I have opinions about what God should do for me and my family, about the direction our lives should go, about the amount of hardship we should face. I have my own thoughts, but we exercise faith by consulting our counselor to lead us each and every day. We tell you as as members of this body, we encourage you, we covenant together to say, we are going to devote ourselves daily to Jesus Christ. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. We ask over and over, what does God's word have to say about that in my life? And so the way that we exercise faith is not by looking to ourselves or our own wisdom, but it's looking to God and to his wisdom. Hey, would you lead me, Lord? Would you guide me? Would you give me your wisdom to know how to be the kind of husband I'm supposed to be or the kind of uh, of wife or father, mother, or single person, whatever it is for your life? God, would you lead me and guide me? He is a wonderful counselor. He is all wise and all knowing. And he wants to lead us and show us how to live in this life. And, And here's the beauty of it. We can experience perfect peace even when the math doesn't add up. Even when you're like, God, are you sure? Even when we don't understand how things are going to work out. Because we're walking in faith. Not in our ability, but in faith in His. Faith in His perfect plan. So we have peace as we consult our wonderful counselor. And we follow His perfect plan. The second way that we can exercise faith and pursue peace is by trusting our champion even in the midst of trials. In John chapter 16, Jesus has been having a discussion with his disciples, and he's telling them that he's going to be going away and that they're going to be scattered. And if you don't know the story, when Jesus was arrested, they all fled. Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was. All the disciples fell away. They fled. And Jesus had told them this was coming. And in John 16, 33, he says, he tells them why he told them. He says, I, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Really? Peace in the midst of failure? Peace when trials come? He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trials. You will have difficulty. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He's like, I'm a mighty God. I've overcome it all. 
You can take heart. You can be encouraged. You can walk in peace knowing that your God has got this. That he's sovereign over the circumstances and the situation. He's sovereign over the storms. He knows what he's doing. And sometimes, without us even realizing it, um, God is at work in us. And he's using the, the, the storms and the trials to shape us. Matter of fact, he promises in his word that he's going to walk, work all things together for good to those who love God and who have been called according to his purposes. Sometimes even the trials that we would otherwise wish to avoid are really just used to deepen and to strengthen our faith and our dependence upon the Lord. We don't have to worry or stress or even fight our own battles. We have to turn to God in faith and trust him to fight for us. We have peace as we trust in his power, even when we don't know the way, even when we don't know how in the world we're possibly going to get through what we're going through. We trust in his power. The third thing, we exercise faith by depending upon our everlasting Father to care for, to comfort, protect, and provide for us no matter how dire the situation looks. I was in Madrid a few weeks ago with Antonio Correa. He's our church planner there. And I remember being struck as I was there, like at how God had done all of these providential things to to bring Antonio and Daniela together with our church and just to make all of this happen. And then I began to think upon the fact that what a huge leap of faith it had to be for Antonio. I don't know how much you know about Venezuela, but it's a, a country that's been devastated economically. Like, they live on a little bit of rice and beans a day. Um, they depend entirely on their government for fuel, and they get just a tiny bit, and they wait in line for hours for it. Like, they're not feeding their families well enough. There's malnutrition. There's a lot of suffering. Their currency is worthless. And yet, somehow, Antonio, who was living in the midst of poverty in Venezuela, has the faith to trust God and to step out and be like, hey, I think God's calling us to plant a church in Madrid. And I was really struck by the fact that he had that faith living in poverty, but that I'm not sure I had living here, the most prosperous nation ever to exist in the history of the world. And I, I remember asking him, like, how in the world were you able to trust God when you had, I mean, there was zero means to make it happen. I mean, he couldn't even afford a plane ticket, much less to, to plant a church, right? And he told me, he says, Jason, we've had to learn to trust in God's provision for everything. Why would this be any different? Listen, we exercise faith and come to know peace as we depend upon our everlasting Father to provide for us, to protect us, to care for us, to comfort us. It's not something we have in and of ourselves. It comes from Him and even in suffering, we take comfort in the fact that God is in control and that he's working, even the difficulties, for our good. We have peace as we trust in our everlasting Father. And then the final thing, we exercise faith, we pursue God's peace by looking to our Prince of Peace to save us and to deliver us from sin. You may be here today and you're like, mm, that's easy for you to say, but you don't know my story, you don't know where I've been. Man, I have sinned in ways that you wouldn't believe. And I've done it over and over and over. You wouldn't believe the ways I've rebelled against God. I've gone my own way. I'm not sure if God could even save me. Well, here's the thing. The Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, has come to secure your peace. God sent His Son to secure your peace. He died for you. And He is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. And we receive this peace through the Prince of Peace. We receive Him by faith. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, man, I pray that today is the day of salvation. That God stirs your heart and fills it with faith that you might trust Him to save you from your sin. But that's really not the end of the story if you're a believer, is it? We have to continue to trust God for our peace even after we come to faith in Jesus. Y'all, I was saved when I was five years old. The biggest failures and mistakes in my life have all happened on this side of salvation, right? The biggest mistakes, and I've made several. If you know my story, I'm the guy that had every chance to get it right. Wonderful parents, wonderful church, wonderful people that invested in my life for my whole life. And in my own 
sinful stupidity. I blew it. I sinned against my wife and my family and my God. I thought ministry was over for me. And it, I deserve for that to be true. But God in his goodness and in his grace, he sustained me through that. He forgave me. Listen, when you've walked with God for years and you blow it big time, sometimes it feels like you can never get back up and walk again because of the weight of shame that you're feeling. But here's the thing. Do you know how we do it? By looking to our Prince of Peace who died for our sins of the past and the present and even those of the future. And he did so to secure our peace Sure, our peace with God, where, where we are saved by him, but also our peace with God in the midst of struggles and failures that last for a while. In the midst of our ongoing sins that we can't seem to put aside. We can have peace, even in our repeated failures, as we trust in his once-for-all sacrifice for our sins. So today, I want you to know that peace is possible. Because God sent a child, a son to us, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to exercise faith. First of all, if God is drawing your heart to him, to, to cry out to God in faith for the first time, confessing your sins, asking God to forgive you, turning from your sins and beginning to follow him. If that's you, man, the next few minutes, they're for you. Just respond in obedience to God. But if you're here today and you know that you know Jesus, but you're not walking in his peace, would you take these next few moments to pour out your fears and your worries and your anxieties and your stresses to God? To just bow your head. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Just begin to call those things out to the Lord. God, I'm afraid, but I know that you're sovereign. God, I don't know which way to go, but I know that you do, and I know that you're leading me. God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this season, but I know that you're my protector and you're my provider and you're my comfort, and I'm going to get through this by turning to you. So I want to exercise faith in this moment in who you are, not faith in who I am, but in who you are, inviting the wonderful counselor and the mighty God, your everlasting father and prince of peace, to fight on your behalf. Now, if you're here and you still can't seem to get through those fears and worries and anxieties, I would encourage you to grab the person next to you and say, hey, would you pray for me? Would you just, just pray for me in the midst of my struggles? You can tell them what that is. Listen, in these next few moments, I want you to do business with God. Exercise faith in Him. You can sit right where you are and pray, or you can stand with us and sing. Uh, but over the next few minutes, I just want to encourage you, exercise your faith in God by turning to Him with whatever it is that you're facing. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you that you sent your son to us to give us hope and to give us peace. Lord, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.